food that's on our table. With today's industrialized method of food production, is what we eat really safe? How are genetically modified organisms in factory farms affecting our food? Genetically modified organisms, GMOs, pose unparalleled threats. Nothing like them has ever existed in the entire course of life on this planet. The campaign of, of ignorance that is currently being waged by the FDA is so insidious that the FDA actively opposes the honest labeling of genetically modified foods. Every single independent study conducted on the impact of genetically modified food shows that it damages organs, it causes infertility, it causes immune system failure, it causes holes in the GI tract, it causes multiple organ system failure when it's eaten, it causes a variety of changes, some of which we can't even guess at, as new proteins are coded for by the altered DNA that we've never seen before. We are playing with genetic fire. Genetic engineering is a process where scientists take genes from one species and force it into the DNA of other species. Even though there's been very little study on the health dangers, there's been sufficient evidence of harm to cause the American Academy of Environmental Medicine to say all doctors should prescribe non-GMO diets to everyone. They say that the animal feeding studies link GMOs to reproductive problems, immune system problems, accelerated aging, organ damage, gastrointestinal distress, dysfunctional regulation of cholesterol and insulin, to name a few. These genetic systems, just in the last five years, have been shown of all higher plants and, and animals are far, far more complex than ever was believed. And so it turns out that in the, in the splicing process that um, mutations occur and can cause immune system problems. And this has been the biggest problem and has been shown a number of times. An immune response is a reaction to something that's foreign that the body doesn't recognize and tries to push out. By definition, genetically modified foods have something foreign. When genetically modified soybeans were fed to rodents, we've seen changes in the testicles, testicles changing from pink to blue, changes in the sperm cells, changes in the uterus and ovaries, in the DNA functioning of the embryo offspring. We've seen smaller babies, a death rate that's five times that compared to controls. Sterile babies, even babies with hair growing in their mouths. And this has been done by government scientists as well as independent scientists who are at the top of their field. American people are beginning to become more aware and wake up to the fact that their government has been corrupted by corporations and the food that they're feeding themselves has possibly serious human health risks. The 1992 policy of the FDA claims that the agency is not aware of any information showing that GMOs are significantly different. And on the basis of that sentence, they said no testing was necessary, no labeling was necessary, and companies like Monsanto, that makes most of the genetically modified food products, they can determine if their genetically modified foods are safe. The most common reason why they genetically engineer crops is so that they don't die when sprayed with herbicide. No genetically modified crop can grow unless it's attached to some kind of a pesticide. Those pesticides, more and more, are in these plants. They may have killed the weeds. They may have killed the insects. But the product is still on the plants. And if it's washed off, then it's in the water. It gets into the lakes. It gets into the oceans. It's everywhere. And it's toxic. It causes cancer. It also causes endocrine disruption. That's a technical term for change of hormones. They don't even want to label that this is genetically modified. The milk is genetically modified, or the crop is genetically modified. They say, if we label that, we won't be able to sell it because people won't buy it. Of course, people won't buy it because people don't want it. The reason why we have 170 million acres of genetically engineered corn and soybeans and cotton and canola oil and sugar beets in the United States is because it doesn't have to be labeled. In the European Union, where labeling is required, 
Uh, there's almost no genetically engineered food on store shelves in restaurants. There's almost none of it planted. Today, more than 50 countries around the world allow uh, labeling of genetically engineered foods. The FDA came out with its infamous policy uh, stating that uh, genetically engineered foods are substantially equivalent to non-genetically engineered foods. The person in charge of labeling policy at that time was Michael Taylor, who had previously worked as an attorney and lobbyist for Monsanto. Uh, after Taylor left the FDA in the early 90s, he went back to Monsanto and then came back uh, to the FDA. The FDA has argued at Codex meetings that the average consumer is too ignorant to recognize the difference between a GMO labeled food and a non-GMO labeled food and they'd make the wrong choice. And that's their stated reason for opposing GMO labeling. The UN uh, Food Safety Standards Setting Organization that's jointly run by the World Health Organization and the Food and Agriculture Organization, that's called Codex Alimentarius. There was an eight year process where all the countries in the world came together and talked about uh, whether there should be safety assessments for genetically engineered crops, uh, genetically engineered animals, and genetically engineered microorganisms. We went to all these meetings over eight years. There's now global agreement that there should be required safety testing for these crops before they come on the market. And you know what? The U.S. does not require that. It's the FDA and the USDA who helped lead the charge for these new food safety bills there's nothing in those bills to protect you. It's there to protect the genetic engineering industry. And unfortunately, if we don't stop this, you won't see organic farmers. The laws in the bills currently are so strict, so, so arbitrary, that if you are a small organic farmer, you can't meet their requirements for safety. As a result, you'll go out of business. As the chemical seed package has spread, and now with genetically engineered seed, seed that originally was free in India because it belonged to the farmers, or was low cost because it was released from the public sector universities that did seed breeding. In the genetic engineering revolution, these seeds are now patented property of one corporation called Monsanto. Cotton seed used to cost five rupees, seven rupees a kilogram. When Monsanto entered with its BT cotton, it shot the price up to 3,600 rupees a kilogram for seed. The U.S. government was forced to spend three to five billion dollars per year to prop up the prices of the GM crops that no one else wanted. The White House decided to fast track biotechnology because they thought it would increase U.S. exports and U.S. domination of the food supply. But the opposite happened. And so the U.S. government was forced to spend three to five billion dollars per year to prop up the prices of the GM crops that no one else wanted. So instead of admitting that they, was a, that they were a failure and withdrawing them, they've been trying to push open the markets, bullying other countries. George Bush filed a lawsuit essentially with the World Trade Organization against Europe, saying that their rejection of genetically modified foods was an illegal trade barrier. We know from WikiLeaks that the entire State Department apparatus has been used to try and push GMOs into other countries. In fact, the U.S. ambassador to France suggested that the United States create a hit list to retaliate against those players in Europe that were rejecting GMOs. Over and over again, the U.S. government has proved that their agenda is to promote biotechnology at any cost. The GMO standards are being passed at the codex level because, uh, frankly, through lies, they're telling them that they're safe crops, that they're safe food products. They don't need to be labeled. We've been fighting for years to get mandatory labeling of GMO foods, uh, and uh, we almost succeeded. But what happened is at the last Codex meeting in Geneva is that the U.S. tried to force this issue and actually called for a vote of this issue, and uh, they lost. They actually lost because they wanted to use it as a bargaining chip 
for a WTO, World Trade Organization, trade dispute to ram GMO foods down the mouths of the European Union, China, and Russia, and they lost. NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, it basically forced corn that was largely genetically engineered into Mexico and took a couple of million farmers off the land because they couldn't compete with U.S. subsidized corn. And so the amount of millions of metric tons that was pushed into Mexico, some of it was planted and it's genetically engineered and it has cross-pollinated with the indigenous corn varieties in Mexico, which are the source of the genetic diversity of corn in the world. So it's a treasure that has been polluted. In India, 250,000 farmers have committed suicide because they cannot sustain input costs. The majority of farm suicides in India are in the cotton belt. 84% according to our study done in Vidarbha are linked to purchase of BT cotton seeds. So we call these seeds of suicide. The poor people, the poor small, small peasant was wiped out right in the beginning because they couldn't afford these chemicals. Shamla's fields were once fertile, but now they bring her only sadness. Her husband Chandar owed over $5,000 in debts and was hoping for heavy rains this season. Three days ago, she tells me, he hung himself here. Ironically, the rains came a day after he died. The most comprehensive analysis of GMOs shows that they actually reduce yield. But sustainable technologies, they can increase yield by an average of 79%. GMOs are stealing the money away from these more appropriate technologies. The ISTAD report proved that organic and sustainable agriculture had the same and higher yields than conventional, chemical-intensive, genetically engineered crops. These herbicides are actually having a major impact in killing the beneficial soil microorganisms in the soil. As a result of the uh, loss of beneficial soil microorganisms, not only have the yields gone down, but there has been a dramatic increase in the rise of crop diseases, which are infecting corn and soybeans in the U.S. For one example of many, in 2001, a small California biotech company called Epicyte patented a product, patented a gene, which causes both men and women who eat it in the form of any product to produce antibodies to sperm if the men eat the epicyte gene, they produce antibodies to their own sperm, rendering them irreversibly sterile. If women eat the epicyte gene, when they have intercourse, their bodies produce antibodies to the sperm that has been deposited, and they become infertile through the destruction of the sperm. Now. DuPont and Monsanto formed a joint venture, purchased the Epicyte firm, and, quote, commercialized the Epicyte gene. Do you want to know if the food that you're eating contains the Epicyte gene? Sure you do. How about the food that your children are eating or your grandchildren? Sure you do. But the FDA, the Fraud and Death Administration, has made sure that under current laws, it is illegal for you to have that information. Any scientist that looks into the, to the research or the lack of research uh, on the, the safety of genetically engineered food 
comes to the conclusion that um, these foods should not be on the market. They need another decade or two of uh, research. Monsanto is the company that told us that PCBs were safe. They were convicted of actually poisoning people in their town next to the PCB factory and fined $700 million. They told us that Agent Orange was safe. They told us that DDT was safe. And now they're in charge of telling us if their own genetically modified foods are safe. Because the FDA doesn't require a single safety study, they leave it to Monsanto. I know Monsanto, as one of the officials of the organization said, we're here to make money. And that's not just Monsanto, that's a lot of food industries. Their job is to make money for the investor. Unfortunately, that becomes the highest priority thought in their minds. Make money, make money, make money. They're not actually making products to make health, they're making money. And so they tend to overlook uh, the health consequences. I think that is a ridiculous sort of approach to the problem. There should be some responsibility being, being assumed by the producer that when they're producing food, they have a reasonably good assurance that it's a good quality product. That should be the highest priority thing. And then if they can make money with that, fine and dandy. But unfortunately, it's usually the other way around. People in this sort of business are looking for opportunities to make money first priority. And then in this case, maybe letting somebody else worry about the health consequences, maybe even the public. And I, I think we have it upside down. That is simply upside down. Why did the FDA abdicate their responsibility to protect us? The White House had instructed the FDA to promote biotechnology under the first Bush administration. And so the FDA created a new position for Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney. So Michael Taylor was in charge of policy at the FDA when this GMO policy was created. And then he became Monsanto's vice president and under the Obama administration was put back in the FDA as the US food safety czar. In reality, the overwhelming consensus among the scientists at the FDA were not only that GMOs were different, but that they were inherently dangerous, that they might create allergies, toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems. They had urged their superiors to require long-term study, and when they saw drafts of the policy coming back to them, they were angry and urged their political appointees to change course. But Michael Taylor and the political appointees ignored the science, ignored the scientists, denied the existence of their concerns, and set forth a policy that allowed GMOs to be put on the market in a way that, that creates unprecedented risk for human beings and the environment. The FDA is composed of smart people, but they're smart people with a conflict of interest. They're smart people who make their decisions based on what will support their financial needs or their academic needs, not what makes scientific sense. What you can do with GMOs is basically engineer food in ways that make it most profitable from the company's perspective. But from the company's perspective, whatever negative aspects of that might exist are simply irrelevant. And more than being irrelevant, the company is motivated to try to suppress knowledge about those negative aspects. The company is motivated to try to suppress government attempts to regulate in relation to those negative aspects. Uh, the company is motivated to try to infiltrate government and lobby government. I mean, when you look at um, uh, the Clinton administration, Bush Sr., Bush Jr., and Obama, uh, you look at um, various high-ranking positions in the administrations of all of those presidents, you find people who have worked for Monsanto. Most people don't realize that Monsanto has been around for about a century. They've acquired lots of resources, and they are very clever and sophisticated. They know how the game works. They understand lobbying. They understand bribery. They have been effective at essentially stacking the political structure, the federal regulatory agencies in their favor to the point that it's almost physically impossible to pass any type of federal regulations or legislation because 
the people who make those choices are, are, have been in the revolving door of Monsanto. They either previously worked for them or they're paid consultants for them. The governments now, wherever they are, are dependent on corporations. Who are these governments? Who are these companies, corporations, telling people what to do, what to eat, what to feed their children? We are people, we're the children of God. We have constitutions, we have our constitutional rights to eat and feed our families that nature produces. They say, no, we don't have that right. In fact, we're going to force that on you. Not a single human being on earth gets up and says, boy, I can't wait to go to the supermarket and buy a GMO food. And why is that? That's because after 30 years and hundreds of billions of dollars of public and private investment, they haven't been able to come up with one thing in this food that actually helps the consumer. No better taste, no lower price, no more nutrition, nothing, zip, zero, nada. 85% of all the genetically engineered crops in this country and around the world are designed so you can soak them with weed killers, toxic herbicides. And who are the big companies that do this? Come on, you know who they are. Monsanto, anybody, what, who else? DuPont, Dow Chemical, Syngenta, Bayer. What, what kind of companies are these? Chemical companies. As the chemical seed package has spread, and now with genetically engineered seed, seed that originally was free in India because it belonged to the farmers, or was low cost because it was released from the public sector universities that did seed breeding. In the genetic engineering revolution, these seeds are now patented property of one corporation called Monsanto. They take genetic material, either DNA or RNA, and insert it using very sophisticated techniques and create an artificial life form, a transgenic species that is impossible to reproduce in nature because the reproductive organs don't match. And as a result, once this form is created, here's the danger, it can cross-pollinate, it can contaminate the traditional crops. Percy Schmeiser was a farmer in Canada who was contaminated by Monsanto's genetically modified seed. Well, he realized he'd been contaminated because he used some of this herbicide to kill off weeds around utility poles on his property. When he saw some of the seed uh, did not die from the application of glyphosate, he knew it must be genetically modified. Well, he didn't do anything to purge his property of that contaminated seed. It would actually take three years of taking your crops out of use before you could completely purge them of the genetically modified seed. He decided he didn't want to do that because that would be costly. So he saved his seed for planting the following year. And Monsanto said, well, you now knew that you had genetically modified seed. You saved it for planting a second year. That's infringement. They sued him for patent infringement. It went all the way up to the Canadian Supreme Court. And although they found that technically he did infringe their patent, they awarded Monsanto no damages. Both in Canada and the United States, hundreds of farmers have been totally bankrupt, lost their farms and so on through lawsuits by Monsanto. So there's a real fear. Now we call it the new fear, a fear culture amongst farmers where a corporation now through the rights of patents on, on a gene have, uh, which is inserted into a seed to make it resistant to a chemical or whatever, is that they lose their rights to use their own seeds or plants. So it's total control eventually that farmers have to go back to a corporation like Monsanto each year to buy their seed they're, as because they're no longer allowed to use their own seeds. As a victim, you basically have to pay for the, your lawsuit, your damages, and so on. So farmers become victims because, and they have done nothing wrong because they were contaminated by a neighbor, by whatever means, by pollen flow, by seeds blown in the wind, transportation, and so on. So it doesn't matter how it happens. If you are contaminated, it's over and it's over. It's inevitable that someone who does not want to use their seed will become contaminated. Even the United States National Organic Program standards acknowledge this. When they say you won't lose your organic certification if you're contaminated up to a certain percentage as long as you take efforts to try to avoid that contamination. Monsanto has said that it's the responsibility of an organic farmer to use large portions of their own property to set up buffer zones 
to try to decrease the likelihood that they'll be contaminated by their neighbors. But that's quite perverse when it's their seed that's the new entrant into the neighborhood. In the mid-90s, the UK government gave about three million bucks to a scientist to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs. That scientist was Dr. Arpad Pustai, the world's leading expert in his field. He worked at the top nutritional research laboratory in the UK, one of the best in the world. He had about 20 or 30 researchers working with him in three different institutes. And his protocols that he was designing were supposed to be implemented into EU law as requirements for the safety assessments of any GMOs to be introduced into Europe. He took a potato that was genetically engineered to produce an insecticide and fed one group of rats the genetically engineered potato. He fed another group of rats natural potatoes and a third group of rats natural potatoes plus their meal was spiked with the same insecticide that the GM potato was engineered to produce. So you have GM potato, natural potato, and natural potato plus an insecticide and all three had a completed balanced diet as well. We measured all sorts of things. Growth, for example, how these young animals were growing, uh, what happened to their inside, and what happened to their immune system. And uh, it became clear uh, that uh, the GM had a, a slower growth. It had uh, problems with uh, internal uh, development of its organs and it certainly uh, knocked out the immune system. Only the rats that ate the GM potato got sick. They had potentially precancerous cell growth in their digestive tract, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, partial atrophy of the liver, damaged immune system in 10 days. What was the cause of that damage? It was not the insecticide because the group eating the insecticide did not have the problem. It was understood that it was the process of genetic engineering itself and the unpredicted side effects that caused this profound damage to every system and organ studied. He shared his concerns about GMOs and was a hero for about two days at his prestigious institute. The press was going wild. Here was a main scientist who was saying that we should not treat the people as guinea pigs and that he personally wouldn't eat GMOs from what he understood. The director of his institute received two phone calls from the UK Prime Minister's office. The next day, Dr. Arpad Pustai was fired from his job after 35 years, silenced with threats of a lawsuit. His team was disbanded. They never implemented the protocols. Instead, a campaign was launched to destroy his reputation in order to promote and protect the reputation of biotechnology. We do have uh, all the methods available for testing, testing the safety of, uh, of uh, GM uh, crops. It will be unforgiven by uh, humanity if we don't uh, do it but use them as our guinea pigs. We have a, a closing window of opportunity that's closing very rapidly. And California, we've been able to implement this citizen's ballot initiative, which and you may wonder why it's so important to pass in California. Well, California is the eighth largest economy in the world. If the citizen's ballot initiative is successful in California because of its size and its influence in the rest of the uh, national economy, it will be logistically impractical for, for most food manufacturers to create two labeling systems. And most will choose to exclude it in the soda industry. Pepsi was required to label a carcinogen. And rather than label that, put that label on uh, that item on their label, they chose to remove it. And this is exactly what's happened in, in Europe. And in fact, 49 other countries in the world where, where labeling is required. Russia, the entire European Union, and even China require this. And by just requiring the labeling, it tends to disappear from the food supply.
DNA is the inherited material of life and it is where genes are structured. So we inherit half of our DNA from our mothers and half of our DNA from our fathers. And within the DNA are the genes that encode for all the structures of the body. So the DNA is like a blueprint. Just like an architect has a blueprint for a building, the DNA is the blueprint for the, all the structures of the body. So when the, a gene is switched on to function, the information within that gene is being used to manufacture a protein. And that protein is then builds the structure of the body and then proteins in the form of enzymes carry out all of the chemical reactions of the body that constitute the, the living organism. Genetically modified organisms are living beings where genetics or DNA of one species is taken out and transported into artificially into another organism and in other words some sort of genetic manipulation, genetic engineering has occurred by taking out the gene of one organism and transplanting that into an or another organism. Nature, God if you like, does not permit that. You cannot take the gene of a bacteria and put it into a pig or a people or anything like that or vice versa. Scientists take genes from one species and force it into the DNA of other species. Now the process itself creates massive collateral damage in the plant or animal, but they don't test for those changes and the side effects before they introduce, say, the crop into our food supply. When the GM gene is introduced into the plant, the en genetic engineer has no control over where the GM gene integrates or splices into the DNA of the plant. And the effect of this is that the GM transformation process as a whole actually is very disruptive on the DNA structure and function of the organism. As a result, very unpredictable and potentially hazardous outcomes. Because if you disturb the balance of gene function, remember the gene function is controlling the structure and the biochemistry of the organism. If you disrupt the balance of gene function, you disrupt the biochemistry. And if you disrupt the biochemistry, you run the risks of creating novel toxins, novel allergies, as well as a disturbance to nutritional value. These types of outcomes resulting from the disruptive effect of the GM transformation process have been observed, are observable, and they're genuine. With our understanding of epigenetics, the new science of how environmental signals control our genes, we're introduced into the chemistry of where do the signals come from that select the genes and modify our genetic activity. Well, we used to say everything was due to the genes, but now we find there's a class of molecules called microRNA. They're very small RNA molecules, and they're found in all the cells. And these microRNA molecules are molecules that adjust the reading of our genes and change the readout of the genes. Well, a new understanding has been found about the microRNA molecules, and it says this. When we eat food, the microRNA from the food is picked up by the digestive system and not broken down. The microRNA is taken into our own body intact. And now what they followed is the microRNA from food ends up in our own cells, like in our liver and other cells in our body. And these microRNAs still have the same function. They change our genetics and they change our readout of our, our genome. And the significance is profound. It says when you eat genetically modified foods, we are eating a new class of microRNAs that have never really been in the world before. And yet, these microRNAs are picked up by our biology and adjust our own genetics. So, in a sense, the old story, we are what we eat, actually now has a biochemical foundation. And then all of a sudden it says, if that's true, then why would you risk your life eating a genetically modified food containing microRNAs that can totally distort our own biology and cause great problems in our lives? The process of genetic modification is a completely irreversible process. 
once it has been carried out, it affects the reproductive cells of the organism. So any effect you have, for good or for bad, is then passed down through the subsequent generations of that particular organism. And that's true for plants and animals, indeed for any genetically modified organism. And this now has to be understood because when we eat genetically modified foods, not only does it affect our own cells like that, but we also know that the bacteria in our gut that are required for our survival, we need these bacteria. The bacteria also pick up the genetic engineered genes and we modified the gut bacteria. And you say, well, why is that relevant? Well, not only do we need the gut bacteria for our survival, but the gut bacteria change our genetics. Information from the bacteria is picked up by the digestive cells and adjusts the digestive system cells to be compatible with the bacteria in our gut. There is a dialogue and a communication. If you alter the genetics of the gut bacteria, by definition, you completely altered the development and genetics of our own cells. Way back in the 70s, the, they developed this grand vision of being able to uh, splice in uh, high yield and drought resistance and all sorts of you know, uh, pest resistance and they dreamt of patenting those genes and having proprietary ownership of these genes uh, and during the 80s, that indeed came about uh, from a, a number of court decisions. They believed they could make billions of dollars from these proprietary uh, gene transfers and to, to make food do certain things or crops do certain things. When the evidence came out that there were fundamental flaws in the genetics, they just did not want to know. They didn't, didn't want to do the research into these issues of food safety. And they went ahead with their development, yet they weren't doing the basic research. You see, GMOs are the product of an infant science. And now we are feeding that product to the entire population. And it's known to create unpredicted side effects, and no one is testing to see if the rise in all these diseases since GMOs were introduced in the mid-90s is caused or promoted by these GMOs. If Monsanto's patent on a gene, that, if that patented gene gets into any, and I'll use the term, higher life form. So what does that mean? Birds, bees, animals, and the question I have to ask, what about human life? If, they, if Monsanto's patent gene gets into you, gets into me, does that say they own me, do they own you? These are all questions that, are very, that the courts and our governments will have to, be, have to address how far does the patents on genes on life go? There have been uh, over 140 lawsuits filed by Monsanto against farmers, uh, including against those farmers who wanted nothing to do with Monsanto's genetically modified seed. CBS Evening News did a lengthy profile about a family farm by uh, David and Don Runyon. The Runyons charge biotech giant Monsanto sent investigators to their home unannounced and later threatened to sue them for patent infringement. I wasn't using their products, but yet here they were pounding on my door, demanding information, demanding records. It was just strictly harassment, is all, all I, I feel as if it was. Yes. The Runyons say they signed no agreements, and if their land was contaminated with the genetically modified seed, it blew over from a neighboring farm. Pollination occurs, wind drift occurs, there's just no way to keep their products from landing in our fields. In February 2005, the Runyons received this letter from Monsanto citing an agreement with the State Department of Agriculture, giving it the right to come on their land and test for seed contamination. Only one problem. The Indiana Department of Agriculture didn't exist until two months after that letter was sent. What does that say to you? So I'm not aware of the specific situation I'm in I'm just Indiana. talking in general terms. Would Monsanto lie, deceive, intimidate, harass American farmers to protect its patents? With farmers as customers, I would say that is not our policy by any means. When you ask Monsanto whether genetically modified seed is natural, they have two answers, yes and no. And it depends on which side of Washington, D.C. they're talking. If they're at the FDA or the USDA, 
They say genetically modified seed is absolutely no different than natural food. It doesn't need to be tested, doesn't need to be labeled. The public doesn't need to know if their food's been genetically modified because it's no different. Then we're on, when they're on the other side of Washington, D.C., at the patent office, and the patent office is saying, well, you don't deserve a patent because your seed is no different than natural food. They say, oh, no, it's not. It's completely different. We've invented something brand new. It's radically different, and it's so inventive we deserve not just one patent, we deserve entire portfolios of dozens and dozens of patents. The United States was the only country in the world, still is, that allowed genetically modified organisms or any organisms to be patented. Up until then, living organisms or their products could not be patented. So the patent for insulin, genetically modified insulin, produced in the E. coli bacteria, was given to Eli Lilly. Monsanto got it for RBGH, the bovine growth hormone. Increased levels of IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1 in the RBGH milk were responsible for major increases in different cancers. Now, this information I supplied to FDA Commissioner von Eschenbach in 2007. He ignored it. I supplied this information to Margaret Hamburg, Commissioner of the FDA. She ignored it. So here we have Margaret Hamburg, FDA Commissioner, being told that RBGH milk will increase risks of breast, colon, and prostate cancers and not doing anything about it. So we're dealing with the FDA commissioners, which in this regard and in other regards, which I could document, have shown themselves to be recklessly irresponsible. What kind of a democracy are we in? When commercial interests, industri industry interests, take precedence of a public health, even when life is threatened, even when there are avoidable risks of cancer? What kind of Alice in Wonderland situation are we in? I have a book called Corrupt to the Core. In that book, I describe by quoting from a published speech by a Monsanto executive saying how they're going to control the whole world, not just by genetic modification, but they're going to take charge of the whole, con whole world by influencing the White House, the White Hall, the French Parliament, and Canadian Parliament, and the Japanese Parliament. This is published information. How are they going to control the whole world?